It's new and improved and better. But is it really better? I mean, is it better for you the same way that it's better for me? Or the thing that makes your experience better, does it wreck mine? Am I having an existential crisis? You know, I'm not. I'm talking about details. I'm talking about the little subtle details that most people just completely overlook. It's never talked about, like because there are no there are no formulas for a car to fit your specific tastes or your specific desire for outcome. You have formulas for everything else, gear ratios, carburation. Okay, you need this much CFM for this much RPM for this much power. So. There's formulas for all of that, and for the most part, we stick within those formulas, and that's kind of like we, what we focus on. But there are subtle, subtle little details that make the difference in your level of satisfaction. And because we don't all have that same desire, we don't all want the same thing out of our vehicles, one size does not fit all. A lot of times, guys will make modifications to their cars because it's an easy modification to make, or because it's an available modification, or because it's the trick of the week, this is the thing to do. And in a lot of cases, you end up wrecking the overall experience that you're looking for. So I want to talk about some of these things. This all came about because of a conversation we had during a live that we did last Wednesday night with Kiwi. And uh, I asked Kiwi during the show, I says, so what's your latest video? And he says, well, we just did a Dakota Dash installation on a 66 Mustang. And I was like, oh, God. right, and I started, I started ragging on him, right, and ragging on the whole thing. And it was unfair, it was, un I'm, not, I'm not apologizing for it, but it's unfair because I was inserting just my personal opinion into something that wasn't entirely accurate and didn't really fit everybody else's uh, goals or objectives. And I even asked during that live, I asked the audience, I says, okay, who thinks we should go over to Kiwi shop right now and rip that thing out of the car? And a bunch of people in the audience were like, yeah, let's go do it. And it would have made a viral video. It would have been great, right? Except that the car had already been picked up. And Kiwi was like, look, I, I didn't want to do this. The customer wanted it, so I did what the customer wanted. Fair enough. But the reason I had a problem with it in, in that particular case, I, I, I knew the car that it went into, and it was a cream puff sort of like, you know, restoration of stock car. And I know the overall effect of putting a modern digital dash, even though it's styled to look like the old one, I know the subtle differences, the, 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 uh, the aesthetic, how it, it changes things. Now, I'm, maybe I'm a bit of a freak for this sort of stuff, because when I set out to build a project, I kind of put that aesthetic first. It's like, okay, what do I want out of this car? What level, or bike, doesn't make any difference. What level of satisfaction am I looking for? What's going to be the thing about this vehicle that, that does it for me? And so maybe I overthink things, right? But I tend to be very satisfied with the stuff that I built, for better or worse. It fits my goal. So I'll give you an example of... of Something I came across several years ago, right? So now I'm a sportster freak. I love sportsters. Now, let's let's get this out of the way first. I understand sportsters are turds. You will never get an argument out of me about that. They're turds. I know. Every manufacturer builds a motorcycle that does something better in every way than a sportster does. No argument from me because I've, I've had them all and I've ridden them all. So I know. I know. But the sportster is my default motorcycle because... It speaks to me. The Sportster is just the right size. It's just the right length. It's just the right weight. It makes just the right sounds. It does just the right things. And it's supremely serviceable. It's one of the easiest motorcycles in the world to work on. And I mean, you know, I just love these things. Okay? You may not, but I do. So, I had been through dozens of sportsters, and they introduce the rubber mount, okay? So now one of the characteristics of the earlier sportsters, especially the Ironheads, Evo's not as much, but one of the defining characteristics of the sportster is vibration, okay? It's like riding a paint shaker down the road. At certain RPM, it's like sitting in an electric chair. Very unpleasant, okay? And it was one of those side effects that I was always like, yeah, you know, okay, I love everything about this bike, but man, that vibration, what a bitch, right? So. They introduce a rubber mount Sportster. This is like a, I guess it was 2005, six, whatever it was. They introduce a rubber mount Sportster. And I'm like, okay, I need one of those. I need a rubber mount Sportster. So 
they were not out in the wild. I go to the dealer, I buy a rubber mount sportster. And I ride the thing for a few weeks, and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. This is great. It's like, it's like riding a dyna, but you know, without having to like wrestle it around, because it's like 100 pounds difference and, and the longer wheelbase. The dyna, to my, from my tastes, is just a little too bulky, right? So I was like, vibration, free ride, and it's nimble and everything else. This is great. I'm loving this. But as I'm riding the bike, I'm realizing, that, you know, I'm not really bonding with this thing. It doesn't, it's not really, it's not talking to me the way my other sports dudes did. And, and I started to realize that vibration, that annoying vibration was like one of the bike's personalities. It was like something that was, it came with the package. It was part of the whole package. And even though I didn't really like it, it was the personality. And when you took that vibration away, a big portion of the personality went away. Now, a lot of this has to do with riding style and riding tastes. So some people love to make long motorcycle trips. I love to get on a bike and go for days. They hit the interstate and they just go, right? I'm not one of those people. My riding is mostly, I enjoy my riding the most in, in you know, the in city and, you know, back roads and twisty stuff. And then that's it, done, right? 50 miles, 100 miles in a day, and I'm happy. I got my fill. I, I have no desire to make road trips on motorcycles. Many people do. So for those people, a vibration-free Sportster is ideal because, you know, you can sit in there for hundreds and hundreds of miles. You can burn down day after day, and you don't get fatigued. You know what I mean? But I don't ride like that. I ride around town, and that vibration, that, 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 that connection between me and the internal combustion device, it was missing without the benefit of that long haul thing. So I never bonded with this bike. I kept it for like a year or so. And when I got rid of it, usually when I get rid of a Sportster, I'm like, I miss it, right? I, any other bike I get rid of is like, okay, done, move on, right? Anytime I ever got rid of a Sportster, it was always like, goodbye, old friend. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> this one over here, I just, I didn't even bother selling it myself. I dropped it off over a consignment dealer and I was like, yeah, just get rid of this and get me whatever you can get for it. And that's, that was the end of, that was the last rubber mount Sportster that I owned, that I, that I will own. So now there was a part two to this also. And, and this fits in, especially when we talk about the dashboards and we're gonna to get to that in a few minutes. When I bought that Sportster, I didn't realize, I didn't know at the time, that they had redesigned the cases so that the transmission didn't just come out. Okay, so with the traditional Sportsters, let, let's say you gotta get into the transmission for whatever reason, it takes about a half hour to pop everything out. And within a half hour, I could have the transmission out and spread across the workbench. No problem. The serviceability of those things of the earlier sports was fantastic. Well, when they reconfigured things to accommodate the rubber mount, they changed the cases. And so in order to do any transmission work, you would have to pull the motor out and split the cases like any other bike. Now, if I had known that before I bought the bike, I never would have bought it. I got a bird in here. If you guys hear, so I, there's, there's birds flying around here. I never would have bought the bike. Now, it's not that I had any intention of pulling a transmission and doing all of that, but it was the idea that now it was a difficult thing. Instead of simplicity, easy to work on, it wouldn't be easy to work on. I never would have bought the bike if I had known that. Now, that doesn't match everybody else's expectations. Not everybody else values the same things that I do. I value serviceability of a machine. Probably, I put more weight in serviceability, ease of serviceability, than pretty much any other characteristic of a vehicle. If it's too hard to work on, too difficult to work on, I don't want it. I'll work on yours, but I don't want it in my life. See? Stuff like that. I'll get to the, to the gauges, to the dash in a minute. But there are other things that are like this. Like, for instance, let's just say, you're not a blood and guts performance guy. You're just an enthusiast and you just want a cool old car. And you want it to sound like a cool old car. You want to have, you remember when you were a kid riding in your uncles, your grandfathers, your cousins, your neighbors, Chevelle, okay? Uh, you know, 68 Chevelle. And so you want to duplicate that. So you go out and you buy a 68 Chevelle. And his car, your cousin, uncle, neighbor, the, old, the one that you remember from a kid, it had a small block Chevy in it, it had a 350 Chevy in it. And this is what you're trying to replicate. But during the course of doing this, you say, well, you know what? The LS is so much better. Instead of putting an old 350 in there, I'm gonna put a 5.3 in it. And it makes sense because the 5.3 is a better engine in every possible 
uh, way, okay? It's improved in every possible way. And if you're building for performance, there's, it's a no-brainer. You automatically go with an LS. But there's one little problem now. You put this whole car together, you've got the LS in there, and you go and you take it for a ride, you take it for a cruise, and you know, it doesn't sound the way it's supposed to sound. And you're like, why? You know, what's missing here? And you can even try different exhaust systems to try to capture that sound. But it doesn't have that traditional burbling V8 sound. It's this, that's the sound of 1843-6572. The LS has a different firing order. It's 187, I don't even know what it is. It doesn't make any difference. It's a different firing order, so the engine has a different tone. It has a different overall sound. And if you're looking for that nostalgic thing, and you're trying to make it a cohesive package, it changes it just enough so that that experience isn't the same. And I know this because every once in a while I'll jump into somebody else's car and, you know, and unless all different engine swaps. And you're like, man, this just doesn't sound right. It, not that it sounds bad. It just doesn't sound like it's kind of supposed to. Now, if it's a performance build and the only thing you're concerned with is ultimate performance out of a given package, well, then it's a no-brainer. Who cares what the damn thing sounds like? Just put it in there and go. But not everybody has that same sensibility. Not everybody is looking for the same satisfaction. I had a, a 67 Dart GT for a while. So this was a 273. It had a, a, a cam intake, headers, and the previous owner to this car put an X-pipe exhaust system in it, along with a pair of floor masters and then stock tips out the back. And this was one of those things, it was one of those subtle things that drove me absolutely out of my mind. So. Here's the thing, the X-Pipe is definitely an improvement. It'll make more power over a broader range than the equivalent no crossover pipe or an H-Pipe. So the X-Pipe is the thing to do. It's the best way to go. The problem is the best way to go isn't always the best way to go for every circumstance. So with this Dart, it sounded, it idled beautifully. I mean, it's, it really sounded like music coming out of the pipes. And under full load at high RPM, it sang, it sounded really, really good, okay? But that's not how I really used this car. I didn't just idle around with it, and, it was, and I very rarely ran it up through, you know, the higher RPM range. Most of the time I drove this car was in stop and go traffic or, you know, 30, 40, 50 mile an hour roads. And in the mid range, it had this sound. It was a horrible sound. Instead of it going, blah, 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 as it was going down the road, it was going, eh. Ah, oh, geez, it was the X-Pipe, it was the X-Pipe, and it wrecked the experience of the car, you know? Yes, it'll make more power, but the aesthetic that I really wanted out of that car and the use of that car at that RPM range, you know, that, that it was normally used, it sounded like hell. And it didn't mean, the car didn't mean enough to me, and I wasn't using it enough to bother ripping it all out and making changes. So I just let it go, and then I got rid of the car. But there's an example of a small, modernized improvement, and it is definitely an improvement, that kind of hurt the experience of that car. Now, it, it goes beyond this, right? I said, maybe I think about this stuff too much. I don't know. But it, it, that's my job, really, okay, to think about this stuff. So a couple of other, couple of other things to, 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 to cover. One of them is paint jobs. You know, the mark of a high quality paint job is depth, right? The deeper the shine, the better the paint job. There's a bird again. I'd open a door and let it, I, they don't go out. You open a door, they still won't go out. This is like they, they made a home in here. So depth, deep, deep paint job, right? That's the mark of quality. And it only stands to reason that if you're going to have your car painted and you've got the, the wherewithal to have a high-quality, deep, luster paint job put on the car, that you would. There's a problem, though. Back in the day, when you go back to the cars from, let's say, the 60s and the 70s, those cars, when, the, when they penciled out the body lines of those cars, the designers take everything into consideration. That's one of the things you have to understand. They look at every little bit of it, and they, and they make compromises and they they work stuff so that it's a good overall balanced package so the production paint jobs on those cars were shiny but they weren't very deep there wasn't very much reflectivity to the paint jobs and this becomes important to know now back in the day when they would do custom paint jobs 
one of the status symbols was how many coats of clear does this car have? Oh, my car's got 14 coats of clear. Well, I got 27 coats of clear. I got 90 coats of clear sanded in between each of them. And the paint jobs were a mile deep. I mean, like a mile deep. They were beautiful, right? There's only one difference between the custom paint jobs that were mile deep in the old days and the ones that are done today. And I said, in the old days, they did graphics. Okay, there was always something to break up or complement the body lines of the cars. So they had panels and fades and iridescent snake skin and all kinds of other stuff like in the paint job of the car. So now to make it really pop, they make it deep, right? But now when you take a car and you leave the body lines alone, right? And you make this paint job too deep. See the factory finish on this was enough to make it shine, but not really to give it much depth. The more depth you give it, the more reflections there are. So this car has a, a sharp body line over here in this piece of trim, and it has another sharp body line over here, and it has a curve in here. You've got all of these different shapes. Now what happens is when you put too deep of a paint job on a solid color on this kind of surface, all the lines start reflecting into each other. So now, when you park the car in certain areas, like certain light, you know, under certain types of overhead lighting or, or sunlight, whatever it happens to be, the lines start to reflect into each other. So you get this solid color that's super, super deep, but the creases, the, 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 the biggest offender of these are 68 and 69 B-body Plymouths that have uh, those, those eyebrows, those creases that are over the wheel openings. Now, they reflect themselves several times into the quarter panel on a solid color car. So when you walk up on it, it's like, what, what's going on with that car? Now, if it was a custom paint job with all different graphics or whatnot underneath it, you wouldn't see that. Do you see what I mean? So it's like, if you're going to keep a car, an older car, a 1960s, 1970s car, uh, a solid color, then don't go too deep on it because it wasn't designed that way. There was, there was a package that was cohesive for a certain amount of depth and a certain amount of reflection. I know you've seen this. I know you've seen this. Sometimes not the best paint job is the best paint job. Speaking from a guy who can't do a paint job to save his life. Wheels are another thing. So wheels. There are lots of reasons to put oversized wheels to go from a car originally had 14s or 15s to 17s, 18s, 19s, 20s. I mean, there's no limit really any, anymore to the size of wheels. There's, there are reasons, there are valid reasons to put bigger wheels on a car. Bigger brakes, you know, you get bigger brakes on a bigger wheel, you get bigger brakes. Uh, better handling, you can get a little shorter profile tire. You get the same overall height, but you use a shorter sidewall tire, so it handles better. I understand all of the valid reasons for using bigger wheels. But if you're not specifically looking to take advantage of those pluses, then what you're doing is you're creating an aesthetic uh, clash in the car. Because when the designers drew out those cars and they put the body line here and the crease here and the wheel opening this shape and everything in proportion, they had a specific diameter wheel that they were working with. And so it all flows together. So now let's just say, you're setting your car up for autocross and, and we're high speed touring, whatever it is that you're doing, and you put the big, bigger wheels on there, well, you make that aesthetic compromise in the, in the name of better performance. But if you're just putting together a cruiser and, well, you know, I'm gonna go with 18 inch wheels or I'm gonna go with 20 inch wheels on this thing because that's the thing to do. You've now created a car that you actually have to kind of like squint when you look at it from a distance because something ain't right. It just doesn't look right. So there are purposes, there are reasons to do certain things, and there are reasons to not do them. And by thinking about your, the, your ultimate goal and the, the satisfaction, both aesthetic and visual, you know, ahead of time, you can kind of step around these mistakes, you know? Here's an example where I went through this. Um, when we, I was choosing the parts to go on Slaghammer. Now, I, the car needed to have slots on the back because it's a period car. It's an era car. But now, during the period of time that this car kind of emulates, the phrase, before, the, before deep dish applied to pizzas, it applied to mag wheels, right? Mags. So, I know they're not mags, they're aluminum, but you get the idea. So, deep dish was the thing. So, when I was 
choosing the parts to put on this car, I had several different sets of slots that had different offsets. But if you want to go with that error, I, you want to have the deep dish. So I used a dragster rim on here. So the dragster rim puts the, the tire out a little bit and it serves two purposes. First, it gives that deep dish appearance that people would have coveted back in the day. And it also squares off the wheelbase. Or I should say squares off the tracks. Because now you see the front and the back wheels are on the same track. If I had used less of an offset on the, on the rim, or, or not as deep a rim, then the wheel would have been further in and the front wheels would have been sticking out. So the effect here is, it's definitely ungainly, but that was part of the car's appeal. I wanted it to be ungainly. I wanted it to look like that car that a five or six year old kid would draw back in 1968. And there it is. Going with the less desirable wheel choice netted me the result that I wanted. Does that make any sense? So let's talk about the gauges because that was a big deal and that was how this all got started. So there's no denying, okay, this I'll say up, up front. I know, I absolutely, I'm beyond certain that Dakota gauges, Dakota dashes, make a fantastic product. I've never heard anything bad about their products. I've never witnessed anything bad about their products. And I'm not saying anything bad about their products. They're fine. But depending on what you're looking for, that may or may not be the way to go. So again, if you're trying to capture the feel of a 1960s car, 1970s car, part of that feel is the softness of the, their accessories. The lighting glowed. It wasn't sharp, it glowed. So you had uh, a, certain, a certain feel. The, let's say the letters and the numbers, the words that are printed on the gauges, they were silk screened in place. They're kind of soft. They, they, they're not laser sharp. All right, and the needles move kind of softly. A modern dashboard, a modern digital dash, even though it looks, it emulates the older style one, has laser printed gauges. It has needles that move instantly, right? They're very accurate. It has LED lighting, which pops, right? So what happens is, the overall effect, you'll have a car, unless you change everything else in the car to match the aesthetic of that gauge cluster, it doesn't match. So now the gauge cluster is the light and the lettering, the, the style of the gauge cluster isn't gonna match what's on the radio or the air conditioning controls. The light coming off it doesn't match the dome light or match the, you know, the map lights or anything like that. You, you create uh, like a, 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 think of it as like a disturbance in the force. It's like an aesthetic, you know, this just isn't quite right. And because it's in, it's the dashboard, it's always in your face. It's like it's a very important element of the aesthetic of the car. So changing just the dashboard without, or the gauge cluster without doing anything else, it sticks out. It's just not right. Now, there are lots of reasons to do this. So if, let's just say, you're putting your car together for long distance driving. You know, you want to make long road trips on this thing and you want the Bluetooth and you want the GPS and you want all of the features that are built into the modern gauge clusters. And by all means, put it in there. Sacrifice the soft aesthetic. But if you're doing a restoration type of car, a nostalgia type of car, where you just want to capture the feel, you want to, you want, when you get in this thing, you want to step back in time, you know, 50 years and, and, and just, you know, turn on, turn on the doors of the monkeys and, and just like, you know, be in that moment, that 1969 moment, whatever it happens to be. You can't do it if you have the digital gauges, like, you know, the, the digital dash, like beaming in your face. It's not the same. And you got a couple of the small side effects too with that. One of them is the gauges can be too accurate. I had a, uh, had a customer years ago when I had, I had the, last, the last Mopar shop that I had brought me a duster that they put one of these digital gauges, digital gauge clusters in. I wasn't at the code. I don't remember what make it was. But he, was, he says, well, there's something wrong with the gas, the gas gauge. And I told him about it, and he says, nothing I can do about it. He says, can you take a look at it? I said, sure. So I take the car for a ride, and the gas gauge 
moves a little bit. You know, as, as you're driving, it's always wiggling. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. And I kept driving the car, and the gas gauge kept going down. And the further the gas gauge went down towards, like, you know, a quarter tank or so, it would sweep wildly. It would just, it would always be bouncing around like that. It was very accurate. If you hit a bump and you made a turn, the gas gauge would be doing this. And that's because it's too accurate. The older gauges were slowed down, and so the new gauge responds instantly. If you have a modern, a more modern car that has a baffle in the gas tank or, or you know, that, that kind of isolates the sending unit, then you don't have this problem. But if you just drop it in, let's say, a 1960s car that has just an open tank, as that gas sloshes around and bounces around, the gauge follows it just like this. GM cars used to be like that. Like Chrysler's were pretty slow and, and they, they wouldn't really move. Same thing with Ford's. General Motors cars, yeah, there would be some movement to it. But on this particular gauge closer that he had, when you got down to about quarter tank, that thing was whipping, right? Small thing. Now here's a not so small thing. Remember I said that if I had known you couldn't pull the transmission out of the rubber mount sports to the same way you could with the old ones, I wouldn't have bought it. Well, here's the thing. When you have an older car, the electrical systems on these older cars, the gauge clusters, they were brutally simple, like everything else with these cars. And to me, and to a lot of people, the brutal simplicity of these things is part of the appeal. So the gauge clusters on these cars had a power source, 12 volt power source, and sometimes it was reduced, but regardless, it had a, a, a standard power source, all the gauges fed off of that. And then each of the gauges was grounded by whatever sending unit it was it was talking to. So the gas gauge had the float in the in the tank and the oil pressure gauge had the oil pressure sending unit and the temperature gauge had the temperature gauge sending unit and that's how each of these gauges was grounded and that's how the gauges reacted and there was a problem with one of them it didn't affect all of them if it was on the ground side or a, a printed circuit they also had printed circuits but they were big primitive printed circuits so when something went wrong with one of the gauges or the whole cluster it takes minutes to diagnose. It's, I mean, it's really, you, you don't even really need tools. You can kind of like know instinctively. If all the gauges are out, it's the power source. If only this gauge is out, it's the sending unit or a break in the wire. So it's like they're very easy to diagnose. Well, when you go to a modern digitalized gauge cluster, there's a computer in there. Not in the gauge cluster, but it goes with it. It has an electronic control unit, right? It has an ECU. So... It's like now they inserted this high-tech middleman. You've got this old car, you know what I mean? And you're trying to maintain the old car character and the old car simplicity, but they stick this electron, this computerized middleman between the gauge cluster and all of the things that it's feeding. All right, you know, maybe you'll deal with that. And maybe the benefit of having the whatever quality, whatever, whatever you're looking for out of that gauge cluster, maybe the benefit outweighs that to you because we're all different and we all seek different things. But to me, I look at it like, well, not only did you make it more difficult for me to diagnose when something goes wrong and much more expensive to fix when something goes wrong, because now instead of it being a $12 sending switch, it's going to be a $500 ECU, because that's what they go for. The digital gauges, the, the dashboards run between like $850 and like $1,600, bucks. typical, right? Uh, the control unit, when it goes bad, is $500 and change. And then on top of that, you're dependent on the manufacturer. You have to hope that whichever company you buy this gauge cluster from stays in business for as long as you own the car. Because let's say two, three, four years down the road, you have an issue with one of the gauges doesn't work or none of them work, and you have to replace that ECU. If that company has gone out of business or discontinued that line, you're out of luck and you've got to start all over again. And see, that's a hassle I don't want to deal with. Myself, you may be different. You may like changing out your gauge cluster every two or three years just to keep things different. We all have different ideas and we all have different expectations and we all derive satisfaction from different aspects of our cars. And the moral of the story in this whole video is for me to say, this is how you should build a car or this is how you should think. The moral of the story here is to think before you make modifications. When the car, when everything is still in its planning stages, think through all of the little details but most importantly, decide on specifically what you want out of that car. You, you, you can't have one car do everything perfectly. And it's kind of pointless to do it. And when you do try to attempt that way, you got one car that does everything perfectly, they really lose character. They lose personality. They become very um, homogenous. 
some people want a car that does everything well. And 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 I'm not. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm going off to a different place now. The moral of the story is to think through all of your modifications, plan through all of the the things that you are going to do to this vehicle with the thought of what am I trying to get out of it before you start turning wrenches, before you start ordering parts, before you start making solid plans. Think the whole thing through. What are you looking to get out of it? And if you do have a specific a specific range of modifications that you want to make to the car, do they all fit together? Will they all work together? Is this going to be a cohesive package? Or is this going to be something that I just hobbled together and it just doesn't work right? You know, if you go to a typical consignment dealer's lot, right, a classic car hot rod consignment dealer's lot, you'll see examples of what I'm talking about everywhere, everywhere. You'll see cars that are like, really restored nicely, right? You know, they've got all reproduction trim and all reproduction upholstery and everything is just like, you look at the car, it's just like, oh, this is so nice. But when you look at the, you look inside the car and it'll have like a, 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 a tribal chrome uh, steering wheel and it'll have this like, like shifter with lightning bolts coming out of it. But everything else is like just the way it came from the showroom. It's like, and you see the same thing with paint jobs. It's like way too deep of a paint job. And when you look up, you walk up on the car, it's like, I didn't know Chrysler put seven different body lines in that quarter panel. And when you finally get up to it, you say, oh, no, it's only one body line reflected like seven different times. You see cars that are built like this. People didn't really give full thought to the modifications they were going to make and what the end package was going to be like, and they lose interest and they dive the cars. And like I said, go to any consignment car dealer, hot rod dealer, classic car, muscle car dealer, go to any consignment place and you'll see examples of exactly what I'm talking about here in this video. Don't be that guy. Think your thing all the way through. Decide what you want out of it and all of the specs, steps you're going to take to get there. I hope you got something out of that. I'll see you tomorrow.